Okay. Um, I'm, what I'm wanting to do today is go through a few things that um, I've learnt over my time, um, understanding that I have sat with but never walked in your shoes, sat with a lot of people that have um, been in your shoes, and some of the things that we know can help. And um, there's, I, I always have a little too many slides and have a whole lot to say. Um, interrupt me at any point. Um, Siobhan will let me know when there's 10 minutes left so that we can at least stop, because actually the discussion with you guys is the most important thing. Um, I'm going to start with this quote. You never know how strong you are until being strong is your only choice. Um, and I think... You know, if any of you had been asked six months before this experience, how do you think you'd do if you had to face metastatic breast cancer? Um, I assume you would be like, there is no way that I would manage. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of days where you still don't know, and it is just, you just don't have any choice. Um, and so you end up doing amazing things and accomplishing things in spite of this uh, nightmare that can be happening. Um, and I remain constantly amazed um, at the strength of the human spirit and the ability to uh, take one knock after another and still be able to keep, um, keep managing. I want to give you a quote um, from one woman um, when we're asking about her experience of you know, the point of diagnosis of her um, advanced breast cancer. She said, I felt angry and then hopeless and then panicked and then I think I was depressed. I had trouble eating and sleeping. It was like an emotional flood with so many thoughts going around and around in my head. What about this person? What about that person? What about me? And I think um, it's hard to actually encapsulate anything in one particular. This was my experience because actually having a cancer diagnosis is an ongoing experience. It's not like you've had been part of a car accident and you need to process that and get through it. It is another thing and then another thing and another thing. So a lot of people do, you know, talk about it being a journey um, and I don't know how helpful that is, but this is a, um, this is a road in Tasmania, so I live in Launceston most of the time and it's called Jacob's Ladder and it's the drive up to our closest ski field. Um, and it's a, one, it's a one lane. So if you're coming down it and someone else is coming up, you have to reverse back to one of these corner bits. And I know that as a young person, I think I went up on the back of a ute once with you know, friends who were trying to see how fast they can do it. I, d I can hardly even do this drive now, like it terrifies me. But this feels like much more of the experience. It's like this, isn't it? Um, and somehow within that kind of trajectory, you're still, you're still managing everything, still managing family, still managing yourself, still managing um, everyone that you've got to meet. Um, from a really early stage when I started working in cancer, which was about 30 years ago, it occurred to me that this was one of those major life transitions and the time that I was being asked to sit with people and, and people who were really struggling with where they were at um, was when they were in the middle of this transition. So um, the bridge that is crossed, and I think there's probably a lot of bridges, but it starts the day that you suddenly find that you have a cancer diagnosis. Immediately your world has changed. And so there was a whole, the world and your life before you cross this bridge and then you're on this bridge. And you've got to walk, get across it. And when you're in the middle of it is the most uncomfortable place because everything you knew, all your plans, all the things you knew about your body, all of those things have been thrown up in the air. And actually, we're not sure what's going to happen on the other end of the bridge. I'm pointing in the wrong direction here, other end of the bridge. This painting is of a blind woman crossing a bridge too. And I think sometimes it feels like that. This is so uncomfortable because as human beings, we want to have a plan. We want to know we're in control. And we, prior to having an experience like a cancer diagnosis, 
can still kid ourselves that we do have control over what's going to happen tomorrow. And I might have a five-year plan, I might even have a six-month plan ahead. Suddenly you're in a place where you know that actually things happen that throw all those plans up in the air. And so that being in the middle of this transition is incredibly uncomfortable. And there's lots of things to watch for whilst you're going through that transition. Um, one of the things is that information, and most of us probably would have gone and found information about things that we had come up against in our life, suddenly information is a mixed blessing. Um, there, it is so, val so f um, now emotionally latent to read something about breast cancer. And yet, I don't know if any of you guys have had this experience, but it feels like the moment you're diagnosed, everything is talking about breast cancer. It's in the newspaper, it's in the, the latest famous person has it, and it's in New Idea, and it's on whatever show. It's suddenly everywhere. Um, and it's not just a case of, I'm going to read everything, because actually you read things and it's something you, you're like, I actually don't need to have that in my head right now, or it's not about me, or it raises a whole lot of questions. And yet, the uncertainty, which is possibly, I think, the hardest thing to live with, is the not knowing what's going to happen next and how it's going to look, drives us to want to get information, because we want some answers to a whole lot of unanswerable questions. So information becomes a mixed blessing, and it becomes, I remember when, um, when the internet became um, at its peak and so people were talking about surfing the web years and years ago and we wrote a like a pamphlet about safe surfing um, which we used all these analogies of actually surfing but actually that's what we need to know we need to choose when we surf um, who's around us when we surf whether it's a safe place to surf um, whether it gives us questions because we know that it often can give us answers that might not be in relation to us but it becomes quite a process to navigate what information is going to be useful for me, um, how much can I take in right now, um, I know that there's some information about that thing over there and I'll go to that when I need it but right now I don't want to and of course all the other people around us that are doing their own surfing and wanting to share that with us. So some of it is about preparing how to manage information. The other big one is this crazy idea that you're supposed to be uh, focusing on the positives. This is, um, there's a, this woman, emilymcdowell.com, if you want to look her up, does all these fantastic cards that kind of tell it how it is. Um, so this one says, I'm so sorry you're sick, I want you to know I'll never try to sell you some random treatment I read on the internet. Um, those are the sort of cards we need <laughs> people to actually go, we get this and we're not going to be that friend. Um, and yet, you know, we talk a lot about friendships. One of the things that happens as a friend, and you've probably all been a friend of someone who's had a big thing happen to them, you want to actually make it better. You want to make them feel better. Um, and the and I think, um, Alicia, you were talking about the um, actually having someone sit with you and let you be in pain is really big and really important because there's not a, a straight answer. Um, I think... There was a couple of um, papers that came out in the 70s and then they were, ex this came up again when there was um, some work done at Stanford University where they uh, had a support group for women with early stage breast cancer and there was some evidence, no, I won't say it's evidence, there was, there was some data that some of those women seemed to live longer than was predicted. And suddenly, in those two studies, all of this information came out about, well, clearly it's about thinking positively, um, that there's a link. There is no link. <laughs> there is no link between your attitude and whether you're going to do better or worse on treatment. There's a, absolutely a link between your attitude and whether your quality of life is going to be good or not. But the pressure to... Um, be positive in a situation that is not positive for you at that time is just, it's an added burden that I've been trying to stamp out <laughs> for years and years and years. 
it doesn't make sense if you are given bad news that you will push yourself to feel positive about it. What makes sense is you go, that's horrible, I'm scared, I want to scream and yell, and also I realise I'm loved and there's things I can do. It's an and, it's not a but. Um, but there's still this push. Um, and I think the push is a little bit about, I need you to be okay in front of me because this is too hard for me to see you sad or worried. Um, but it's also a bit about this idea is if you fight it, um, then you'll be okay and I need you to do that. Both those things are unacceptable to ask anyone to do. Um, and what we know is, when I was talking about the strength of the human spirit, is that most people who are able to actually feel their emotions cope with the biggest things that you would never think you could cope with. It's when we put this pressure on people. Um, now, KP talked about trauma, and I think um, it was mentioned this morning, and I've always used the term trauma when I've talked about the experience of cancer. But I'm currently involved with, um, at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, we are looking at transforming the whole hospital and the way we do things using a trauma-informed care um, framework. And the reason for that is that we are understanding more and more that many things that happen in life are traumatising, and I'll explain what I mean on this slide in a sec. Um, and we used to always think about trauma as being, I've been through um, the car accident I mentioned before, been in a major car accident and it was horrific and I've been brought into hospital and everyone goes, this poor person must be traumatised. What we haven't fully understood is that there is big T trauma, it's literally called that, and there is small T trauma. And small T trauma is what it feels like when you walk into a room with people that you've known for a long time um, and no one knows what to say to you and you get that feeling inside. Or you're given uh, some bad news or you're told you need to do another treatment and that feeling that you get inside, it's often invisible to everyone else um, and yet it is, um, it has a major impact on us, it changes us and we therefore need people to be aware of the fact that we need to be treated very uh, gently and we need to be um, shown support in terms of trust. We need to have trustworthy people around us. We need to feel um, like we can collaborate in our care, all of those things. So let me just explain to you what happens when something traumatic happens to us. So we're thinking about an adverse event that overwhelms our ability to cope. And I'll tell you a personal experience um, that probably sounds shocking, but I can talk about this um, without it upsetting me at the moment, but it's just a good example, I think. So 10 years ago, in a couple of weeks' time, I was on a tram going to work in the morning and my niece rang me to say that my sister had died. She'd not woken up. She was 50, had six kids, single mother um, in Tasmania and she just hadn't woken up. She'd died in her sleep. And so I was on the tram and I remember, so here I had an adverse event that was overwhelming. So these are situations where we're like, oh my God, I don't know what to say or I don't know if I can keep standing here or whatever. And I'm on a busy tram and I can remember having the experience of that is the most shocking news I've ever heard and I'm on a tram and I need to somehow get a phone call to my mum who had just lost, we'd lost our dad a little few weeks before. Um, so that I, someone was with her when she found out. So I'm going through all this stuff. Okay, so event happens, overwhelming feeling to cope. Your mind becomes flooded with emotion and we often unconsciously stop feeling our trauma partway through it. And some of you might really um, understand this. It's like you're watching yourself in a movie. It's like you're in the room and you can see it happening but you've left the room in that moment. Um, and, you know, often there's no sound or anything, you're just going through the motions. And there is a cost to this, even though it's really clever, because it enables us to still manage when something terrible happens. Um, but at some point we need to be able to go back to that and go, OK, I need to, to actually deal with the, the feeling. We know that children who had, um, have been through abuse when they were little, 
They can describe how they left the room. We know that women that have been sexually assaulted can say the same thing. It's like it ha it's happening to them and they leave the room whilst being in there. That happens to us many more times than we, I think, have ever quite understood. And what happens if that is a big enough experience and we don't get to process it is that it gets triggered later on. So something might happen. I might be on a tram. The phone might ring. <coughs> excuse me. And... Um, I'll suddenly be feeling very, very upset and it won't make sense to me unless I go, this is reminding me. Um, <coughs> my voice is actually going, I'm not getting upset. But <coughs> is that an experience that you would um, relate to at some point or points in your breast cancer experience? <coughs> yeah? Mm. People say they never, you don't forget what the doctor was wearing, what the room was like, what they said. What they said. Yep. Um, <coughs> I remember someone saying to me that they walked out of the room and it was like the sky was green and the grass was blue. And then, and then you walk out of, if it's the hospital or whatever, and you walk down the street and it's like everyone else just getting on with their lives. And this massive thing has just happened to me. That's what I mean, it's silent. And so there are lots of those traumas and I, now I consciously use that term because I don't want to underplay. Um, you might say, yes, I had a big surgery and it was traumatic, and it may well have been, but we need to understand these, the everyday things that happen and that you, you overcome, but um, until we start labelling it and understanding that, I'll tell you this quote, <coughs> that trauma is not what, what happens to you, but what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. And we can all probably think of experiences maybe when we were a child and we were yelled at by a teacher or any of those experiences and you're sitting there but it, it's inside what happens to you with that dread or that feeling. Um, we need to understand that much more. We said this one this morning, I'm going to get it. Um, there's a whole lot of stupid things people say to us. I'm not quite sure. You can see this has actually been made into a card. That's how popular the um, people are saying, but you look so good. Um, but if we unpack what that actually means, it's about um, people not getting it. Um, it could be that you feel, OK, that's good, because when I walk down the street, I want to be able to walk down the street and not have everyone go, oh, my God poor thing, how are you, you know, so it's okay, some days you might want to put on every item of beautiful clothing and makeup and, f and have that on looking good, but um, I think it hurts because it's like, do you have any idea what I'm going through? And I think it's even more so, will you excuse me for chewing while I'm talking to you, um, with metastatic, thank you very much, wow. Um, with metastatic disease because when I first started in this area, if I was asked to go and see someone who was diagnosed with metastatic disease, it would be about talking about end-of-life palliative care. The whole world changed probably 15 years ago, I think. We got some treatments and then we found that women lived and lived and lived and lived. And so, and we actually started at BCNA for, I think about six years, we had a, a specific telephone counselling service. We did it telephone because there were lots of rural and regional women that weren't getting support, just for metastatic disease because none of the services kept up with that experience. So there was this, okay, I've got metastatic disease, I'm being told this is not curable, but um, what am I supposed to do now? And if it's five years down the track from that, then everyone's either thinking, I must be fine. But I'm living knowing this and I might be taking tablets that have different impacts on me. Um, uh, <coughs> but <coughs> We're slowly catching up understanding that we still don't know how long we can 
keep people going on these medications. So it's still early days. Um, and it's great news, but it also comes with its own costs, doesn't it? With this not knowing stuff. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So if you're crossing this bridge, what are some things to look out for? Um. <coughs> I'm coming back to you again, Alicia. You said something like this this morning. I think we so underestimate the burden of I've got to now ring mum and I've got to tell my partner and I've got to tell the kids or my best friend. Um, and every time I tell them, it hurts them. And yes, I'm not, I'm, it's hurting me too, but um, especially if I can say as women, when we're the ones that we want to, you know, nurture everyone, the, what we carry in terms of other people's stuff is really hard. Um, and so that's, it, these are like the adding of the things that we, that we cope with. When I talk about the impact on families, I like to use the analogy of these, one of these um, mobiles. <coughs> God, what is happening with my voice today? Um, <coughs> it's all right, I'm not stopping for you, I'm just choking. Um, <laughs> some of you will know um, us social workers draw families like this. It's like a genogram, or you might have seen with a family tree. But these mobiles, they all hang off each other. So if we think about this as a family, and say the blue piece, if that is blue to you. <laughs> of course, I'm so sorry, thank you. You're good at this, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, say the blue piece is the piece, the person who gets cancer. So if I come along and I flick it, because that person just had a big thing happen to them. What happens with the rest of the mobile? Well, it moves, all the bits will move. Some of them might get tangled up with each other. Some of them might just move a little bit. Some of them might spin around like crazy. Um, this is what happens when a cancer comes through the front door. Um, and I, when I talk about family, I use that term quite loosely. It's whoever is in your um, tribe, the people that are important to you. And I've always believed that when a diagnosis happens, we need to go, what does the family need? Not just what do you need? Because we know that impacts on um, the person living with the disease a lot with what's happening with the family. But basically this is about the fact that it affects everyone differently. And it makes total sense if you've got a couple of teenage kids in this family, um, there might be one of them who doesn't want to leave your side and wants to go to all your appointments and wants to know everything. You might have one that goes, yeah, okay, that's terrible and then keeps playing footy and doesn't come home very much, whatever. There is no right or wrong, but what we need to know is that it impacts a whole family and in terms of support, we need to support the whole family. Um, yes, I've just stated all that. Impact on partners. Um, We've heard this morning of someone who had a partner who left, absolutely happens. But we know that partners who are very much part of the experience and they stay there um, through it all, um, we've done enough research to know that partners are impacted at least as much and there are some studies that suggest they're impacted even more. What we know is they're impacted very differently, very, very differently their experience, what they've heard, how they understand it, what supports they need, what information they need um, is quite different. They might want to have some really straight conversations about um, what are the chances of my partner living because I actually need to get this in my head. Um, when I used to be referred couples, it would be usually at the end of the first lot of treatment because everyone held it together and we're just going to look after her. And then treatment finishes and then it's like, okay, I don't know what's happening with my life now and this is terrifying me too. I'm not sure what the right thing I'm supposed to do is. So again, we could do a whole lot better at supporting um, the person with cancer by supporting partners and, being, and actually giving them space to do that talked a little bit about um, children. I think the important thing, and it's, I'm talking about whether it's 
whether you have children or you have grandchildren, you have little people in your life, um, what we know is that they are very susceptible to the stress in a family and there are still, f I still have families who go, it's, you know, they don't even know what's going on, we've chosen not to tell them. Yeah, they do, I can tell you, because I've had lots of kids that I've been asked to sit down with and I always start with, what do you think's going on? And they've heard bits, they've probably thought because cognitively children are the centre of the universe, that's how they view the world. Um, so they've blamed themselves somehow because no one's really telling them but something big's happening. Um, we need to involve them. We need to give them age-appropriate information. We need to leave the door open for them to come and ask us questions. And they will. So they might hear the news, they might be a bit upset, they might be okay about it, but then, you know, two weeks later they might come in and go, so, you know, there was a movie on. <laughs> is that you? Or whatever it is. But we know that we need to involve them. Mentioned a bit about friendships this morning too. Um, actually, nearly everyone has someone they thought would be have been there that wasn't. Um, it's quite astounding to me, and again, there's been research on this. And nearly everyone has a couple of people that they would never have thought would have been so amazing, and they were. Um, and it hurts. Um, it's one of the other griefs that comes along. And we know it happens because some people can't cope with this. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons. It doesn't really matter. Um, the fact is that right when you're trying to work out who you still are, where you fit in the world, who you matter to, um, most people will have had someone that they're like, I don't know why they didn't call, but they didn't, and that was hard. Um, and that is just a part of what we have to experience. And of course we embrace the people who rally around us because um, they are the magic of what he keeps us going. And as much as we know lasagna is overrated and it does often come, um, there's something amazing about a meal that someone cooked for you when you're feeling horrible, even if it's not something you really like that much. It's such a nurturing thing, isn't it? And it's such a joy that someone does that for you. And then I think, think about the impact of your relationship with the world. I'm going to read this out for you because it's kind of long, but I, I think it kind of picks up some of the essence of what I've heard can happen. So, Chris and I attended an anniversary brunch about two months after my diagnosis with METS. And I sat there thinking how different I was from everyone else there. I was sick, I wasn't sure of the future, I had to endure suffering and I hated everyone else for the good life that they had. I've become very impatient over the years with other people and their complaints. How dare they complain to me? I usually get over it and become my old supportive self. I want to be the one that's there for my family and friends. I hate always being on the receiving end. Sometimes I feel so inadequate and yet I know how much I'm loved and how lucky I am. I just feel like that quote kind of just encapsulates so much um, that there are moments when you know, I want to. I want to not be on the receiving end. I want to be there to support. I, I still want to get invited to the life events of my family and friends. And sometimes it hurts like hell to be there. Um, and there it is. <laughs> it's constantly this, isn't it? It's the the balance of all that. And of course, there is no getting away from the feeling of I miss what life was like before I had to carry this. Um, and it, it is what it is, but you're allowed to say, I just wish I could have it one more day where I'm not worried, um, or that I've, it's just back here, but I, was just, I wish I could have that back. These are the griefs that you're allowed to have, I guess. And not knowing what is coming with the future. This um, quote here is, it's a delicate walk to balance hope with chaos. And I think when I do this, I think this is an important, um, that, that um, it's almost a pendulum and there has been, there's a, a model understanding some of this experience and it, it's also the experience of grief, that it is like a pendulum. So there are some days when it's, it's just fine and I can cope and there are some days when it's just not and, it, and we go like this. That is really normal. You can feel like, God, I'm crazy, like today's okay, tomorrow's not. Um, but actually that's the most common adjustment that we move in and out of it. So what do we know that can help? 
So the first thing, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, is um, that if you have periods where you are feeling very down or very anxious or um, very angry, whatever you're feeling, you are being a normal person in an abnormal situation. If you have developed anxiety symptoms or depression symptoms, that's not because you're weak, that's because you are a person who has been handed so much to deal with that a very understandable response is that we develop some of these um, ways of trying to adjust. So accepting that um, I am a normal person living under a really hard situation and the only way to do that is that some days are okay and some days are not is really important. Um, acknowledging the distress that you carry um, is not a personal failure. It's the, the most um, healthy thing you can be doing. And knowing that we're, we actually know what to do these days with anxiety and depression. There's some really useful things that we can do. So not feeling like, gosh, of course I'm feeling down, no one's going to be able to fix it, um, is not true. So it's really important to be able to own those. Now this one is very, f you know, oh no, it's, it's probably easier to see. In big auditoriums, this one's hard. This is one of the best tips that I've had when we're facing overwhelming things. So here we are and we have in front of us this enormous staircase and we're not even sure where it's going and how far it's, it's got to go and it feels overwhelming. The simple thing is we focus on that first step. So there are some days when I might be speaking to someone who um, says to me, I just, I can't do this anymore, I can't stop crying, I can't stop worrying, I can't function. And on those days I might say, do you think you can make it till lunchtime? And let's have one plan about what you're going to have for lunch. Um, let's shrink life right back down to this thing in front of us. And then there might be some times when you go, I can make a plan. I feel confident to book a weekend away in three weeks. Don't ask me to think beyond that, but I can do that. So those, how many steps you can focus on at any one time changes. Because what our minds do is it runs ahead. What's going to happen with this? Is there, what's going to happen? Is there going to be another Christmas, another ten Christmases? Is my child going to get to this age? Far too big and completely out of anyone's hands. And so we have to learn how to shrink right back down to this one step at a time. And it's a, this is a movable feast. We need to do it constantly. Can I just do this day? Um, you guys all made it here. And part of you must have gone, I don't want to sit in a room and hear about metastatic disease. Um, but you did. And so there are often days when we just can, all we can focus on is that one step. Um, I'm going to get up today. I'm going to make one phone call to a friend this week because this is not a good week. And then there are other times when I go, do you know what, I've had a couple of days and I haven't really thought about things. So remembering to shrink things down to what's manageable is really important when it feels so big and unknown. Next one is challenge your thoughts. Has anyone done any um, anything called that's called cognitive behavioural therapy? Yes? One of you have. I'm going to give you a very crash course in about two minutes of what it is. So we often believe that if we think something it's true and actually it's not true because as human beings we often are led to what is called um, automatic negative thoughts. And we all have our own traits about which ones we run to. Um, nothing's going to work out or it's, be, it's going to be worse than I think or whatever it is. So um, what happens is, and I'll give you a couple of examples, is that something happens and we have a thought. So let me give you an example of you get up in the morning, you're feeling kind of okay, you're having a cup of tea, you read the paper or the news online and there's a story about a new treatment for advanced breast cancer and there's a thought in here but you haven't even really acknowledged it of I cannot get away from this it's everywhere so you don't really acknowledge the thought but it was in there and then you go and you find you're washing up and you're like slamming things down and you're a bit aggravated and the phone rings and you don't want to speak and you don't realize that actually something happened back there that was a thought so thoughts will 
bring about our feelings, bring about us doing something. And if we go back and go, let's challenge that thought, we can get hold of some of these. And I think living with uncertainty is a really big one that this can help with. So let me give you an example. Um, okay, so one of them is uh, you hear some of your friends all got together and went out without you. I like this example because we think that it, these things don't hurt us anymore. They do. When we get older, it still does. Okay, so the automatic negative thought, and these are often irrational, can I say, um, for this person is they don't really like me. I don't mean anything to them anymore. So somewhere in there that thought came. That brings about a feeling. You start to feel down and upset. Life isn't like it used to be. I used to be able to be part of everything and I'm not. You then might have a physical reaction that is a stress reaction. So we all have different, some of us get tight in the shoulder, some of us get a headache. Um, but this person starts to, well there you go, both <laughs> gets a headache and tighten the shoulders. And then they withdraw and they decide I'm not going to ring anyone anymore because it's too painful, so I'm not going to. Okay, so that thought has brought them around to this behaviour. That's the automatic negative thought. Okay, another one. You notice that your shoulder hurts when you're hanging the washing out. <coughs> Let me draw it from here. Um, a thought which is really common when we get a bit of a pain somewhere is it's the cancer and it's now in my shoulder and it's terrifying. So we immediately start to have a bodily reaction to that. So we might get um, heart palpitations and our breathing rate goes up. This person goes to bed and withdraws, doesn't want to face anything because it's too much. Um, and they may avoid going to the doctor, um, even their GP, because it's too scary. If they went back to challenge that thought, which is the trick that we need to learn how to do, and they say, um, there are lots of reasons why my shoulder could be sore, because I spent the weekend gardening. Could be that, not sure. But I need to just calm down right now and go, okay, yes, my shoulder is hurting, I don't want to ignore it, but it could be something else. So right now I need to calm my breathing down because I've got myself all tense again and make a plan which be, is I'm going to um, take some Panadol, I'm going to use a heat pack, I'm going to give myself a couple of days but I will go and see the doctor in two days if it's still there. So now I can let go of that stress right now because I'm not ignoring it but I'm not going to panic about it. So that person's gone back to that thought and challenged it. Another one. Oh. I haven't jumped, jumped off. The, the other one I was going to um, give you the experience of is uh, that you've got a scan coming up. And often people kind of, you know, they go, okay, I know going and having scans is, is um, scary and it's not really something I like to do, but you might not see that the day before you're starting to snap at everyone that's going you know, around you. Um, if you're able to go back and go, okay, what's happening? What's happening is I'm, I'm worried about tomorrow, so I'm going to plan for that and I'm going to let everyone know, sorry, I'm a bit short with everyone today because I've got this coming up tomorrow. It's an understandable thing. I'm just going to state it as opposed to I'm terrible, I'm hard to live with, I'm not coping. So it's about constantly challenging when we find ourselves getting into a situation where we are... Um, suddenly feeling very overwhelmed yeah of course um, that we have to that we go back and we go when did I start feeling like this I need to challenge that particular thought it's really powerful I've just told you in a really a couple of minutes but if you look it up um, it's really a very it's one of the most powerful things I learned to do for myself and then number four is learning to let go what you can't control this is a good one for all of us control freaks in the room because we keep, I do this too. I'm like, I might, there might be something on and I really hope it doesn't rain tomorrow because this thing's on I'm, and I really worry about it. And God, it's, look, oh my God, there's a dark cloud, it's going to rain. I have no control over whether it's going to rain or not. So we, if we go through what do I, can I not control, it leaves me with the energy of what I can control. So there's a list here of some things um, living up to the expectations of others completely out of our control, so let go of that one. 
um, the fear of failure and holding on to control, which we worked out the day you guys got that diagnosis that you actually can't hold on to control, but you can control little things. The need to please everyone. <laughs> the fact that I was always there for everyone and now I actually can't be, and I don't like how that feels, but I've got to let go of that because I can't control that. Um, comparing myself. Everyone else seems okay. You might have even done it. Um, you might even do it when you're around other people with advanced breast cancer. You might go, God, everyone else is coping really well and I'm crying every night. Yeah, no, probably not. So it's about comparison, terrible, terrible thing to do, the need to be perfect. There's a whole lot of other ones. The weather, <laughs> whether um, I'm going to be able to keep working this much. You might not be able to control that. So you can put a whole lot of energy into, I really wish I still could, or you can go, that bit I can't control, but I can control these other things around. And then my second last tip, um, and this comes partly from, um, this is what I did my PhD on, which was around the role of meaning in life um, in the setting of cancer. Sounds very wanky. I'm going to explain it to you in a much better way. So we started by interviewing a whole lot of people, 100 people, with um, advanced cancer. This was probably 15 years ago, so a while back still stands true, I think. And we just asked them what their daily life was like and what experiences they like. And then we analysed all of these interviews and they seemed to fall into these three domains, we'll call them. Um, so the first one was suffering. So whatever the suffering part of it was, the things that were hard, the physical experiences, the worry, those sorts of things. Um, the next one was the um, coping. They're just the things you do to get through the day and to the things you have to just do. But the other one was meaning. So when I talk about that pendulum, it's like there's all this suffering and there's this, and I am more. I realise I'm more loved than I ever knew I was. Those things coexist. So if, let me give you an example. Someone. Um, wakes up in the morning and they've got some stiffness from some um, bone pain. So they wake up, eyes open, and they go, oh gosh, my arm really hurts. And they think, this is horrible. I don't want to wake up every morning. It just reminds me straight away. I don't want to get up. I don't want to face the day. And then their partner or friend or whoever comes in and says, come on, you know if you take your pain medication now and you go and have a warm shower, um, you, and let's just get you moving. That's so. They've started off with suffering. They've gone into coping. Just the stuff that we need to do. So they go and have a warm shower. They have something to eat. They have some met pain medication. And then a friend says, um, why don't we go for a walk? It's a really nice day. So they go for a walk and they think, oh, I love this friend of mine. And it's so nice and look, the leaves are all changing and falling and it's beautiful and I notice all that stuff. They're in meaning. And we do that constantly. <laughs> we move in and out of it. You did that constantly before this experience but it's even more amplified now. And so one of the things that we, that came out of this and it, it's now a therapy that's used, um, is the stuff that's meaningful to you and when I say meaningful, I don't mean this kind of what's your meaning in life and what was you put on earth to do and what are you achieving. It is the stuff that brings you a little bit of joy. It's actually ordinary meaning. So it might be... So for me, I grew up on the coast in Tasmania um, and then I lived in like inner city Melbourne for 20 years and my husband always knew when something bad happened to drive me to the coast somewhere. I just needed to be by the ocean. That is meaningful to me. It has a major impact on my whole self to just be able to be near the coast somewhere. Um, it might be that there are little people in your life and you just need to get a bit of a dose of them and the way they view the world is just innocent and beautiful. Um, it might be having a nap. Oh, God, a nap in the afternoon and letting yourself... Reading a good book, um, going somewhere in nature... These all sound really simple little twee things. No, they are actually the things that really matter. And so when we get into a, a place that is full of stress, we have to dial in. This should be a prescription. 
that you make sure you put it in your diary. I remember that I feel great when I do A, B and C. I'm going to damn well make sure I do it. More of that. And the reason why we think this works is because it rebalances things. So the very no the normal thing is, and we ended up um, getting these three domains and then putting them into this very ancient Celtic, um, thank you, um, symbol because we wanted to show that we move in and out of them and we do all the time. But if we're not doing much of the meaning stuff and that can happen when things are hard, it falls down. So we need to be dialing in some of that. So let me give you some examples. So it's the pursuit of little meanings. It might be a fascination with nature. This is part of Tassie. It might be doing what you love, which may not be stage diving, might be, but it's that feeling that you have when you're just, when you're in that moment you're actually, and you're forgetting time. You're actually in, you go, God, I love this. Horse riding, whatever it is for you. Kindness, giving to others, just being able to place ourselves with beautiful things that we see. Connection, 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 if we could do, do a dose of that. Um, and even if you don't have enough people in your life that you feel really close to, actually just attending something like a craft course or something where you're connected to other people. We learnt this really well during COVID. When we stopped doing that, people started really overthinking about themselves. So connection with others is really important. Um, so the question that I want to leave you with is what do you need right now? And I say that because it changes all the time and sometimes if you've been living with this for a while, you're like, well, yeah, I've got my supports and I know my doctor and stuff, but what right now is going on for you? Um, what do you need to do to take care of yourself? Are you getting the best medical care? Are you feeling confident about the information you've got? Um, do you need some more supports in one area or another? Um, is there something more? in all the possibilities of things that would enrich your life right now. And your answer might change in a month's time, but it's important to do that stopping and checking in. And I think probably the final thing is um, that you have to allow yourselves to not be brave sometimes. Nothing bad will happen. <laughs> You'll just take some of the pressure off. So courage here does not always roar. Sometimes courage is that quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I'm going to try again tomorrow. I had one of those days recently. I tried to achieve a whole lot of stuff. Nothing went right. And I went, you know what? I'm going to try again tomorrow. OK, I'm going to stop. And we have some only a few minutes now. Thanks. It is working, yes. Thank you very much, Carrie. You're welcome. Um, and I hope that um, what Carrie has spoken to us today about has resonated with you and given you some practical tips and strategies um, for yourself. But we do have about eight or nine minutes now <laughs> to open up um, to any questions that you have for Carrie. And um, I think this is connected, so I'll bring the, ca the microphone over to you so that we can hear it in the recording later. So specifically, I'd love to know whether any of that resonated with you, or even if any of it didn't, and you're like, you know, it wasn't like, it's not like that for me, this is what it's like, because I think that's helpful. Yep. Mm. I'll just come at that mic. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Please. <laughs> um, I've got... I was diagnosed just recently. OK. Um, and my daughter came along to one of the... Is that better? My daughter came along with me. She didn't normally come because we hadn't been speaking for 10 months. OK. And yep. she decided, you know, you're not telling me anything. I thought, well, maybe if you pick up the phone or respond to my text, you'll yep. find out. Mm. But anyway, she wanted to come, so she came and my... Oncologist, my oncologist said, um, you've got metast metastatic cancer um, in your liver from, okay. from my yep. breast cancer. Yep. And my daughter said, well, how bad is that? And he says, well, you know your mum had stage four in her breast. That stage four has now gone into her liver. And she goes, oh, what's her um, life expectancy? Yep. And he looked at me and I says, hey... The reason she doesn't know anything is because yep. she doesn't speak to me. She yep. doesn't contact me. So, hey, give it to her. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, with what you've got, blah, 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 it could be four to five years. Mm -hmm. And she goes, oh, okay. And anyway, we finished the consultation and I said, do you want to go out, Rick, and I just want to have a word to the doctor. And he said, 
were you okay? I says, yeah, I'm fine. He said, are you sure? I says, yeah. I says, hey, I would have run out of money by then. <laughs> but see, that is my... This okay. is what I'm concerned about in yep. myself. Okay. Um, I couldn't resonate a lot with that only yep. because I am such a positive person. Yep. When I joined Mandra Angels mm-hmm. and it went round and everyone talked about what they have, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking, oh, my God. And it came to me, mm-hmm. Shri, would you like to talk? And I said, oh, no, I, I won't talk. And then the next time I went, I says, I will talk. I says, the reason I didn't talk at the last meeting is because I feel like a fraud. I said, all you people are having all this bad time and all Mm -hmm. this suffering and all Mm -hmm. this. And I said, I'm really sorry. I just don't, you know, I really honestly felt like a fraud. (laughs) But I'm not because it's, you know. That is how it is for you. But that's how it is. And, (coughs) And I love... Love, love. It's where Amanda Angel's breast cancer support social support group, mm-hmm. and I love taking the ladies to their um, um, appointments and yep. all that sort of stuff because yep. we laugh. <laughs> I l- like yep. to make people happy. I like helping people, mm. and to me, mm. and, and even still with everything that goes on, I'm thinking, you know, have I got this right? Have <laughs> I re- have I really got it? Yep. Um, so. And I really feel sorry for... Uh, we've got over 70 members. Wow. You know? Wow. And I, <coughs> I love helping them. And, yes, we do meals and, yes, we do all this sort of stuff. Mm. But I think I must be really... My circuit must be really broken. <laughs> you know, all the edges are frayed and everything. Yeah. Because yeah. the... Um, or, or am I suppressing mm-hmm. the reality? Mm. So that's what I'm concerned with. Yep. But I haven't as yet, you know... Yeah, and water comes out of my eyes, but that's because I've got dry eye syndrome. Yep. They're not tears. Okay. <laughs> I have them, but they yep. very rarely come out. So I'd mm. better pass on to someone else. So I just thought I'd share that. Sure. Because I don't know if, I'm, if I've lost the circuit, <laughs> you know, or yeah. is it going to hit me one time? Mm. Because I'm really not phased. My mm. partner left me three months before I got cancer. I thought, fabulous, because it would have been all about him. Mm-hmm. And... You know, my daughter was getting angry at me because I wasn't asking for help. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I don't need help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe I should have asked for, you know, help to make her feel better. Yep. But then I didn't want to, Im- you know, because she's got two kids and she's got a job and all that sort of stuff. So it was, yep. a, so I thought, oh, well, I'm sorry, Rick. I just don't, that's sort of, I think, why she wouldn't talk to me mm. because I didn't need, I should be helping, she should be helping me. But I just didn't need the help. Hmm. So, um, there's a few things that I'm, I'm thinking um, from what you've told me. Um, the first thing is that when we talk about meaning for you, it's about giving to others mm-hmm. and that's where your meaning come from, mm-hmm. comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you're much more comfortable in that place and that's been something you've been able to really continue to do and that's mm-hmm. great. Um, when you say, sometimes I, you know, I, have to, I think, I don't even know if I really have this, really common, really common feeling. And it's, um, I mean, part of it, I think, is when you have your whole life turned upside down, there's part of us that just is in shock and we kind of go, I can't take that fully in. What is it, what that means? Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is we bring all of our coping mechanisms from all of the rest of our life to this experience. And so, you know, you've I kind of suggesting in my mind that this is one of the ways you've coped with lots of big things. You go, yep, not going to let this get me down. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep focusing on other people and on what's positive and I'm going to just, I'm not going to dwell. So that's one of the ways, that's one of your coping mechanisms and it's absolutely working for you at the moment. Um, and look, it might be that... that you might get a symptom and it go and you go hang on a minute this is really scaring me and I'm not sure or it, or you might just continue to do what you've clearly learnt in your life and that is I get news and I focus on what's in front of me and I keep going um, and I would say you've done that probably for a long time mm-hmm. and um, age, of six. age of six yep totally understandable then you work that out then mm-hmm. that's how you're going to survive and um, and that's working for you and that's absolutely fine. Um, and even the point where, I mean, to have your 
to you know the point where your daughter doesn't speak to you for ten months um, gives me a sense of how strong that is for you. I'll be damned if I'm going to pander to someone else. That's not how I've survived. Um, and there's a little six-year-old in you who's still doing what she needed to do then, and it's working. So good. You be proud of that. There's nothing to say you have to be any of those other things that I've suggested. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Anyone you. else? I think we've got time for one more question. A bit more. A bit more. Um, yeah. So we might, we might just have a slight ritual of one. <laughs> That's still going, yeah. Or, or even... Okay. Even if you've got any thoughts about kind of what has worked for you that... Um, yeah. I think the, this is my seventh year. Okay. Seven years, yeah. I'll, seven years I was uh, diagnosed de novo, which means straight off yep. the static, <coughs> um, which was a bit of a, bit of a shock because, yeah, well... First they tell you you've got breast cancer, then they yeah. go, oh, it's already spread, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, over the years, I've always been a person that helped others, which was hard for me to try and put myself first. So Absolutely. it's taken me a long time. Yeah. But a lot of that stuff that we went through there, like, um, yeah, people saying that, oh, you look great, blah, 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 you finish your treatment and all this. It's it's always a difficult thing to explain to people that mm -hmm. don't quite understand that you're mm -hmm. always on treatment. Yep. So, yep. Um, and it's just, uh, it's, it's to manage the disease, not to cure it, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I just learnt over the years I've changed a lot with putting, trying to put myself first and not taking people's, can I say crap? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just let it go over my head. I was head. about to say crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. Just, uh, yeah. Um, yep. They say, oh, I've got to be positive, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, mm. but, you know, I've been going into seven years now, so. Yep. It's not, not, not as if I haven't mm. been positive, but mm. of course you have times when, especially when you're changing treatments all the time, um, side effects change, of yep. course, so you have to adjust, so you, mm. you just feel like you're jumping hurdles all the mm. time and mm. trying to get up that ladder, and so people don't really see all that, so yep. I personally think I'm a pretty strong person in myself. Yep. Even though I probably don't show it to people, so. <laughs> um. So can I ask you when I was talking about the um, the steps that mm -hmm. go up, how has that changed for you in terms of how, okay, I feel like I can, I don't know, cope with this many steps? Do you, has that changed over yeah, the that, seven that, years? Well, that change, as I said, changes with different treatments yep. because, yep, you know, how am I gonna? Uh, how's this treatment going to affect me, side effects, blah, blah, blah. Recently I uh, had a lot of pain, I was in hospital and they were just trying to, ju you know, work out the best pain management for me, so, yep. um, which took quite a while to get the right, right. for yeah. now. Yeah. Um, so, managing the pain but also because I have a fair bit in the liver, so the liver's pretty much not coping great. So yep. trying so to that manage complicates everything. complicates all of the Yeah, so you got to, yeah, i got to be careful. Got, yeah, i got no gallbladder. So um, it's just a matter, yeah, just finding the right combination and the yeah. right thing for me. Because mm -hmm. everyone's different, of course. So yep. some treatments work for some and some don't. So... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just keep going and, um, yeah, so yeah. I think that's a bit of my story. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Thank you for sharing that. It'll be great to have an oncologist in here that you can drill down and you can ask yes. him. Yeah, I mean, I've got, got a pretty touch. good... Uh, yeah, that's good. ...took a while. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, seven years, everyone knows me now, so in the oncology <laughs> ward and... Yeah, so, yeah, yeah Bumbrae's pretty small, so everyone knows <laughs> everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Thank mm. you for yeah. your time. Thanks. Thanks. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just uh, like to say some of the ladies from my group already know my story, but um, I was in hospital for three months, at, and wow. um, yeah, and I, my parents got called over twice. They didn't think I was going to make it, mm. but I had a big turning point when I was in hospital. When I was basically lying flat in bed, couldn't move. I had a male nurse come in. He just wanted me to roll over because they wanted to change the sheets. And I just said, I can't do it. Mm. And he ticked me off. And that's what I needed. Yep. And okay. from that point on, I was determined to get out of that hospital. Even though I was well looked after. Don't yep. get me wrong. Understand. But that's what I needed. Yep. You know, because I honestly yeah. did think... And I was feeling sorry for myself. Mm. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I was determined to get out of there. And I did. And I'm here today. Mm. So you needed someone to remind you you could do it. Yes, I, I needed that proverbial kick up the backside. <laughs> you know, so yep. I was determined to turn my life around, and yeah. I've said I got a, I dealt with early breast cancer, got yeah. through with flying colours, mm -hmm. and that's how I'm going to treat this. I know it's a bit a lot different to just early stage breast cancer, but mm -hmm. um, yep. I just think you know, I've got it. I'll deal with it. I'm living more or less a normal life. Yep. I, went, I went back to work. You know, I work um, nine day fortnight. Have a have a break, have a long weekend every second weekend. But it was just something that I needed. Yeah, yeah. I get and that. you know, and work was fantastic. Having that support group. Yeah. Other than the support group I've got mm, here, mm, you know, mm. but work, family, it makes a big difference, mm. and it really got me through the worst of times. Yeah. So yeah, so mm. I'm here today as living proof. You, you are. can't you can't overcome it. Absolutely. If you want to. As I, yeah. I know you mentioned about sometimes it, 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 it might be psychological, mm. but I found mm. with my early stage breast cancer, getting through treatment, Yep. as I said, I um, had four doses of chemo mm. every three weeks. I was back at work in between treatments. Everyone was amazed. They mm. go, how mm. do you do it? I said, I don't <laughs> know. I just do. Just do it, yeah. And six yep. weeks of radiation, went to Perth for that because I didn't have it down here in Bunbury. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I came through that with flying colours, no mm. side effects at all. Mm. And because I was warned what could be expected, but I had nothing. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for it to hit me, but never did. Yep. And I think just having that positive attitude, yeah. it does really help you yeah. get through everything. Mm -hmm. And having it now, yeah, I good. think it's helping me get through it as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Anyway, Thank that's you me. for sharing that. <laughs>